First of all, let's talk about what happens if we have what we call a preceding reaction. This would be, for example, a reversible chemical reaction or uh, ex exposed and then an electron transfer process. So we have some species Y that is not considered to be electroactive, makes species O, and that would be our C sub R step, and then O can be reduced to R, and that would be our E step. All right, well that um, doesn't seem that likely, does it? Well, in fact, lots of reactions are this way. You have a precursor form of the material that does not undergo electron transfer, but can produce a form of the material that will undergo electron transfer. And a good example of that is the dissociation of, of weak acids. Most weak acids are not themselves, they themselves electroactive, although I shouldn't say most. Many weak acids are not they themselves electroactive, but the uh, proton that under, is part of the dissociation process is electroactive. So if we take acetic acid, for example, CH3COOH, that material itself does not go undergo electron transfer at normal potentials. So, but it can undergo, as we know, a dissociation step to form protons and acetate ion. And the proton is now able to be reduced. To, uh, And they call these waves that you got out of here kinetic current waves. Why is it kinetic current? Because you can see it actually that the process undergoing here is related to the overall rate of the reaction, the precursor reaction. Um, and under most cases, what we'll get out as current will be limited by the rate at which we, this equilibrium can be maintained. As soon as we start to use up some of this hydrogen ion in the reaction, what's going to happen? Well, by Le Chatelier's principle, more of the acetic acid will be dissociated. Remember, under normal conditions, the, um, if you just put acetic acid in the system, very little of that material is going to exist in the dissociated form. Only about 10 to the minus 5 molar of the materials of the dissociated form. But as soon as you start reducing that proton, more material comes in and uh, undergoes that reaction. So as you see essentially for CE reactions, are often you'll see what they look like steady state waves. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Where instead of the wave height being limited by the rate of an electron transfer process or the rate of mass transfer, will get a kinetic current control. Now the important thing to remember is that these are often sort of one extreme or the other. Often we'll show extreme examples of the behavior that we'd expect because we can get mixtures of the two types of systems. We get a system where the reaction is reasonably fast and this is reasonably fast and then we'll get a mixture of kinetic control or the so-called kinetic control and uh, diffusion control. And so you'll see waves that may not look exactly like this. But at the limit where the kinetic control is strong, you'll get currents that will be, have a kinetic plateau. And so you get these CE type waves. And those are kind of interesting, especially previously when people didn't see these types of waves very often with normal electrodes. You saw them for rotating disc electrodes, but normally you wouldn't see these, where now you see these kind of waves for microelectrodes. You don't think too much about them, but 
Now this was kind of unusual for initial people working in the, thing, in the, in the field. Let's take a look, look at another one we we'll call it EC prime. And this is an interesting case where you have oxygen plus an electron goes to species R. And R reacts perhaps with species Z or may react by itself to undergo a situation where you regenerate species O. So we'll call this a catalytic process. That little prime there indicates catalytic. So Z might be some solution phase oxidizing agent that they, it, it themselves is not pretty easily oxidized or reduced at the electrode maybe because of kinetic problems or some other things, but in solution you can undergo a, an oxidation process to, to make, regenerate O and R. It's ruthenium biopyridine complex, remember we talked about that before. And um, as a uh, as part of our polymer uh, polymer electrolytes, when we're doing a polymer uh, redox polymers and um, polyelectrolytes, can be oxidized from the two plus to the three plus, and rubipi three plus. can undergo a reaction with oxalate ion and you regenerate the rubipi 2 plus in solution plus you make carbon dioxide out of the system as well. So oxalate is going to be oxidized, can be oxidized by the rubipi 3 plus, but it turns out it can't be oxidized at the electrode potential that the rubipi is being oxidized at. So it can undergo an oxidation in solution with the rubipi 3 plus, but not at the electrode at the particular potentials we're at. So what might we expect there? Well, we might expect that the amount of current that is seen at the O, at the, for the reduction of species O, is going to be proportional to the amount of catalyst that we've got in solu solution, the amount of Z that we've got in solution. Also, it will depend on the rate of that reaction of R plus Z, and it will depend on the mass transport properties of R plus Z. We'll take a closer look at these mechanisms a little bit, or a little, these are the process a little bit, and what they have, what they'll have as an effect on the wave shape in just a second. So I'll give you an overview here. Another type of process, so-called ECE reaction, very, very uh, common type of electron transfer chemical reaction set of steps, where you have species O plus N1 electrons going to species R1. And R1 undergoes some sort of chemical reaction. To form O2, O2 goes to R2 and that will occur perhaps at E02. So you see O2 is coupled to O1 only through this chemical reaction step. And so this is the key to the behavior, this chemical reaction step. If that chemical reaction step is very, very rapid and the time scale of our experiments is reasonably slow, there will be essentially no effect of the kinetic in there at all. It will look as if as soon as you make R1, 
O2 is immediately formed. On the other hand, if this rate is very slow and your time scale of the experiment is fast, uh, the K term in there has no effect on the electrochemistry because you'll never get to O2 because there's no time for that process to occur. Now, let's take a couple of examples. Now, suppose E1 is less than E2, E02. What's going to happen? Well, if that's the case, O2 is going to be immediately reduced at the electrode surface. Why is that? Well, the potential at which we've made R1 is more negative than the potential that O2 can be, is re normally reduced at. So it doesn't have any chance of escaping out in solution. As soon as O2 is formed, boom, it undergoes a reduction right at the electrode surface. So what do you might we expect the wave to, how the wave would be changed? Well, in that case, it's effectively as if this process is an irreversible one for the reduction of our, our reduction of O1. As soon as R1 is made, it disappears. And so the equilibrium is perturbed and we have an, an, uh, we have a, um, an irreversible type of reaction. If E01 is less than E02, then the opposite, then a different situation would take place. In that case, you'd have two separate electron transfer waves and you would not see any effect really. They would be coupled, but they would not necessarily be affecting one electrochemistry. The electrochemistry of O2 would not affect the electrochemistry of O1. O1 would look just normal and O2 would not look so normal. Now, let's take a look at this particular path again. We can reduce that O2 immediately at the electrode surface, but there is an alternate idea that most people will agree can happen. And that is that R1 can also reduce O2. Because the potentials are such now that as soon as we make um, O2, because the potentials are such, O2 and R1 can undergo an electron transfer in solution and that's going to be allowed because of the way the potentials are. So that R1 and O2 react to form O1 and R2. Now the net effect is the same. We still put in the same number of electrons. In this case we'd have, say it's N1 plus N2. Usually it's two. N1 is one, N2 is one, so there's two overall. So we'd have an electron in here, an electron in here. In both cases, either if we reduced O2 immediately or if we undergo this second step, which they'll call solution electron transfer, or some people call it disproportionation reaction. because it's uh, formally a disproportionation process. So you can see, even though we never get a chance to have an electrode put electrons into uh, O2 here on this particular step, because we've regenerated O1, there's twice as much as it would, there would normally be at the electrode surface under those conditions. So it's effectively, we still have a two electron process. Now ECE gives you, if it's really an ECE reaction where we actually have a, the oxidation or reduction of O2 right at the electrode surface, that gives you one set of waves and if it's not ECE, you get a subtly different set of waves which they'll call the DISP reaction, D-S-I-S-P or DISP-1 or DISP-2 depending on the exact details of the process. And those waves do not look exactly the same. In fact, a lot of people have spent a lot of time teasing out the details between whether it's a direct electron transfer at the electrode surface or we're getting a disproportion at the electrode surface. 
Most people would suggest that it's a disproportion reaction because if you think about it, when you have this K in there, that's a time delay step. For R1 to go to O2, there has to be some sort of a time delay if K is at any reasonable value. So as R1 is delaying its process, it's diffusing away from the electrode surface. So it's likely that O2 is being made away from the electrode surface at any particular point in time. At that same time, we've got R1 that's diffusing away that has not yet reacted to form O2. So R1 and O2 are both present away from the electrode surface and that can give you the conditions for the solution electron transfer. Only when we don't really expect R1 and O2 to get together because say the concentration of those species are very low, then we can force the O2 having to go back to the electrode surface and pick up that second electron. Also if the electron transfers or the K value is very rapid, that would be another case where you'd get a direct ECE reaction. Okay. Let's take a look at one particular case. And most of these you'll notice are ECE reactions that I'm going to draw. Let's try that again. Are organic reactions because they've been really well studied. This would be parabromobenzophenone. And we'll call this ARX. It's an aerial halide. X is often used to indicate a halide. And parabromobenzophenone, okay, remember this is a, this part without the bromine on is benzophenone, so. And if you put that in acetonitrile, and you'll notice a lot of these reactions that people do these studies on are in non-aqueous solvents, and that's because water is so reactive towards many of the intermediates that we see that it interferes greatly with the interpretation. So much, much of the interpretation work is done in non-aqueous solvents where we can effectively remove the water from the process. So ARX, parabromobenzophenone, plus one electron will undergo a reaction and it'll have a heterogeneous rate constant, okay? And this is the electron transfer rate constant to form a radical anion. It's an anion with one unpaired electron in the, in the overall process. That would be E01. The formal potential for that you know, would be step one. ARX radical anion is not particularly stable. So we'll undergo some rate constant we'll call K1 to the radical species plus the X. What's happening is that we've cleaved off the halide species forming X minus and rad aerial radical. So we've got a -benzo or benzophenone radical and bromine in solution at this point. Now, most radicals are very easy to reduce. They're unpaired electrons, so it really doesn't matter to them if they're oxidized or reduced. Almost any sort of electron source or sink will, will suit them to kick, get another electron to, to uh, pair up that electron. So it's either going to be for a radical, it's going from a radical to a cation, or a radical to an anion. In this case, because of the electrode potential, we're going to be at a potential where the aerial radical is easily reduced. So AR dot plus the one electron goes to the AR minus, which is a very strong base, by the way. It's an aerial ring essentially with one proton missing, and that's going to be very apt to try to take a proton from some other source. It acts as a very strong base which means it's not likely to be something we'll find as a stable material. So here we have our ECE reaction. But 
but we can also have this SET reaction or so-called DISP1 for disproportionation reaction one. And we can have our aerial radical, uh, oops, sorry, plus the radical anion, and that will be considered to be an equilibrium, that's a big K, equilibrium process to form the aerial halide uh, and the aerial anion. So the bromobenzo, the benzophenone anion is formed and the bromobenzophenone is regenerated uh, by an electron transfer between the AR dot and the ARX minus dot. So steps, and this would be um, step four. So steps one, two, and three would be formally an ECE reaction, and if the reaction underwent steps one, two, and four, it's the DISP1 mechanism. Let's take a look at this reaction now. Even if this reaction is not forms this AR minus, notice the end result is the same in both cases. We, we form AR minus, and at the end of both sets of steps. And if we look at the number of electrons here, there's two electrons to form one AR minus and one X minus. In this case, we have two, one, two electrons to form, uh, doing the disp one step, we still have the same number of electrons. We put in one electron, a reaction occurs, in solution to transfer an electron, we regenerate our ARX my, X plus quantitatively and stoichiometrically, and we can reduce that again at the electrode to put that second electron in. So in the disk case, again, the radical does not get reduced directly at the electrode surface. It turns out that this particular case is involved in a second another step, because AR minus is a strong base, it's likely to react with any source of proton whatsoever, and even very well prepared solvents like acetonitrile will always have a small amount of proton, protons in there from water, which you just really, it's impossible to remove. So what'll happen is that the AR minus plus H plus will react with another electron, uh, another uh, chemical step to form ARH. So we'll end up with benzophenone as our final product in this particular case because this will react with traces of hydrogen ion in solution. So this is actually an ECEC reaction. And that's, a, that's pretty common, actually, this sort of step. Now, as I said, the other situation was the E10 greater than E20. This is like an EC reaction. With a second electron transfer at more negative potentials, for, say for reduction. And as as you can see, you can mix and match some of these reactions. We can have an EECC and so, so forth and so on. So these are simplest cases for a lot of these particular cases. All right, 